What's up, everybody? This is Elliot Terrell with ArtofMagic.com, and you're listening to Magical Thinking. Thanks so much for returning to the show. Our guest this episode is Ricky Smith, one of my all-time favorite people. He is one of the funniest guys I've ever met, a dear, dear friend, and one of the best light of hand practitioners on the planet. If you guys were a fan of Book Club, then you will be excited to know this is sort of like a book club reunion show. Everybody that emailed me in and asked about book club and if it was ever coming back, I responded to you by saying, we're doing something special. And the podcast was the answer to book club, but this is a special episode just for you guys. This was a laid back one. Uh, We had been at the castle very late and we had gotten up early in the morning to record this episode, but it was a ton of fun. Ricky tells his hilarious origin story, which was absolutely hysterical. It was a blast to listen to. Dave and Coley sat in the room and listened the whole time. They were our captive audience, and so it was very informal, very fun. Since we recorded the episode, Ricky has started performing at As Is, which is a bar in Manhattan. I'm sure you can find out some more information about it online. He has done a bunch of shows there. He's not really shows. He's doing walk around, but it's a great time. I know someone that went and saw him perform and said that it was absolutely the best time she'd had at a bar in New York. So check that out if you're in the area. Ricky gives us some performance tips, some studying tips, and of course the most hilarious and amazing origin story. He talks about befriending Dan and Dave and also meeting some of his greatest influences and heroes. I really hope you enjoy the episode because Even though I talk for maybe two minutes of the hour and a half that we do, it is a short episode, but even though I talk for barely any of it, we had a great time, and uh, he was just so lovely. Uh, Make sure to follow us on Instagram, at Treasury of Wonder, and at A Sense of Mystery, and to find us on all the other social media accounts with at A Sense of Mystery. Don't forget to email in if you have any questions or comments or suggestions at podcast at artofmagic.com. Sign up for the newsletter if you haven't already, and I hope you enjoyed this episode of Magical Thinking. All right, see you later. That's too loud. No, that's Two, really good. Three. My stupid cackle. Four. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> what a lovely start to Scotch and Books. Or a Scotch and Podcast at 9.30 in the morning. Snap, cackle, and pub with Ricky and Elliot. <laughs> the Serial Podcast. <laughs> Brought to you by Kellogg. Does Kellogg make Rice Krispies or something else? I hope they do. <laughs> Otherwise, this is terrible product placement. Yeah. Fix it in post. Ha <laughs> another serial joke. <laughs> Jeez, we're getting somewhere. <laughs> Fix it in post. <laughs> Mm. Oh man, I'm trying to come up with a general mills joke. It's just not <laughs> happening. <laughs> just your general run of the mills <clears throat> humor. Uh, let's tell everybody what we did last night and why this podcast is going to be so fun. Uh, <laughs> last night I slept with David Coley, <laughs> <laughs> who is currently a live captive audience. This is our first live podcast. <laughs> In the nude. Always. <laughs> <laughs> and Hilton. Don't forget Hilton. He's always in the nude. It's not fun anymore. Get some pants. <laughs> Get a job, Hilton. <laughs> <laughs> we went to the Magic Castle with uh, everybody that we know. <laughs> <laughs> and stayed up way too late and... Yeah, got into it. It was fun. Yep. We've long been told that the way to achieve our goals is through careful reasoning and conscious effort. But recent research suggests that many aspects of a satisfying life, such as happiness and spontaneity, are best pursued indirectly at the Magic Castle with all your <laughs> friends in bed. <laughs> It's science. It's science. Oh, man. I missed you, Ricky. It's been such a long time. This is our throwback episode to the book club. Yeah. Poor old book club. 
I haven't had a scotch since. <laughs> <laughs> well, but this is like, people that email in and ask uh, about book club and demand that we do it some more. Uh, I say, there's something coming. Yeah. Someday. And this is it. <laughs> this will be the special one that I send everyone that emailed me. Welcome to <laughs> podcast with no books. <laughs> <laughs> No real intelligent discussion of any kind. <laughs> we have no structure or anything to base our comments on. <laughs> <laughs> That's the idea. <laughs> oh, man. Ricky, you're one of my favorite humans. Thanks. And I don't know anything about you. <laughs> <laughs> I was raised by lemurs in the Swiss Alps. Very shortly thereafter, I was a man. <laughs> I've been living off the proceeds of one of my family's inventions of the first cells dividing. And uh, I just get royalties, and then I live. It's nice. One one millionth of a cent for every cell that divides. You're very wealthy, man. My uncle, uh, he invented happiness. A lot of people use it. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> snorting coffee out of my nose. Oh, frivolity. <laughs> it can cause so many mistakes. <laughs> um, but for those for those of the folks at home, our lovely listeners, all four of them. Um, <laughs> what how how did you get into magic? You're one of the uh, the greatest in the whole I, world. I was an ice dancer. And then <laughs> I met Dan and Dave, and they were doing uh, bottom deals and the diagonal pump shift. And I was like, "Learn me that." And uh, they said, first read some books." And I said, "Okay." So I learned my alphabet, and uh, they came back later. You know, they lived at this shrine on top of a giant mountain. And uh, they were making coffee, and then they showed me the way. Or, uh, oh, it was the opposite. <laughs> I was on the shrine. I forgot. You know, once you become enlightened, you just can't understand, you know, which perspective things are. <laughs> Everything is one. You're all on the mountain. <laughs> we. <laughs> well, okay, so it's... <laughs> It's a general coming of age tale. I was a young man in love with pasteboards. <laughs> uh, I met him on OK Cupid. <coughs> Our profiles synced up exactly. I was 100% like, percent I need 52 lovers and popped right up. <laughs> um, as entertaining and lovely as that was. That wasn't an answer to my question. Uh, okay. Uh, I started out in magic. You know, I got a, a magic set, and it was had a hundred tricks or something. And then I told all the kids at school um, I was going to do a magic show for my birthday because I had a magic set. And they all came over for my birthday. And it had a cardboard uh, cut-out table that I set up, and I was all ready to do my miracles, <laughs> not realizing that there was a secret method. <laughs> and so I put the ball under the cup, and then it did not disappear. And I was like, WT fuck. And then my dad came and saved the day because he knew about instructions, which were beyond <laughs> me at the time. And the ball disappeared, and I was like, what? How did that happen? How did these miracles occur? And so I was into magic, you know, slightly. And then uh, later on, I went to one of those magic masters. There was one in the bowels of our hotel (laughs) when we were on a family trip. And I got fooled really bad with scotch and soda. I was certain I was going to get a free dinner and everything (laughs) that they had at (laughs) uh, magic masters when I passed him the English penny, which turned out to be a quarter. And... uh, Ever since then, I've had low self-esteem and <laughs> <laughs> memory issues. And then, uh, like, my family got me four decks of cards, so I knew four tricks. 
<laughs> Watch the card rise. All right, I'll put these away. <laughs> and then, uh, have you ever heard of a stripper deck? Well, let me show you my next trick. <laughs> and then, so I had these general tricks that I was doing. And then we went to Pier 39, I think it's called, in San Francisco. And they had this great street performer. Bill Ockel. I didn't really know his name at the time or that uh, too much about him. But he threw playing cards over a building <coughs> and he did the cups and balls and he produced money from it, the air and tossed it in a bucket. And I was like, that's my dream. I want to do that. And my dad was like, well, go ask him. You know, because like <laughs> adults, you know, they know how to do stuff. And I was like, no, I can't do it. <laughs> <laughs> so my dad made me and... Uh, he told me about Ricky Jay's book for card throwing, and then he told me... How old are you at this time? <laughs> <laughs> I was eight. <laughs> and then You're going to love this book, kid. <laughs> you got me through some very formative years. And uh, it's funny, at the time it was nearly impossible to get. Well, it still is. Yeah. But... Uh, we searched for a long time. Every family trip, my dad would go, go to the bookstore and ask if they had it. And one time when we were in, Tor like, I think Toronto or something, uh, somewhere in Canada, uh, we went to one of their big bookstores, and they're like, yeah, we have two copies. And uh, my dad ordered it, and it came in the mail. Wow. We paid, like, regular price for it. And then when I met the twins, I was like, here you guys go have one of these. <laughs> you know, so I gave them their first porn, and uh, uh, then I found out how much they were worth, and I was like, "Give it back." <laughs> That's not true. So he told me about cards as weapons, and then also about Bobo's modern coin magic, and like uh, we were staying at the haunted mansion, which uh, I don't know if it exists anymore, but it was this haunted hotel and. They had a little theater, and it was pretty cool in San Francisco, and uh, they had this big sign, IBM meeting, and I remember my dad being all pissed. He's like, it's going to be full of all these boring computer idiots. You know? <laughs> <laughs> really, it was the International Brotherhood of Magicians meeting, and uh, my dad woke me up, you know, because I had gone to bed already, and then brought me downstairs. And uh, that guy from the street performing was there, and he taught me the French drop and, like, the Downs palm. Mm -hmm. And uh, we got the modern coin magic. And so I, I basically just learned palming <laughs> <laughs> for the, the next 65 years. <laughs> I would just sit with coins palms and uh, do the French drop and then put them in Downs palm and hold up my hand in front of people and then produce coins because <laughs> I wanted to produce coins from the air. But uh, that got me started with books, and I started getting a lot better. And I got the Tarbell set that Christmas. Wow. And it was like, I walked out, and there was just this wall of color <laughs> in front of the Christmas tree, because my parents were too lazy to wrap made books. <laughs> and I was like, oh, Santa, <laughs> he's the greatest person I've ever heard of. <laughs> How old are you when, all, when you're getting this stuff? Like uh, I was, you know, I guess I was seven or eight. You know, it was pretty young. Yeah. I didn't really know what I was doing. I, I read the books. I liked the introductions. Yeah. You know, like all this stuff about magic. And then uh, I learned palming and a few slides. But the routines were beyond me. I'm like, who the hell would want to <laughs> have four coins in a coin box? You know, like, that's bullshit. No one, <laughs> no one ever wants to watch that. You produce money from the air. That's all you do. <laughs> And you palm everything. <laughs> and uh, so I was just doing that. I was super into coins. I hated card tricks. And I was like, I didn't understand them. I think I was still pissed that I couldn't shuffle. You know, or something that my cousin could. <laughs> Even my mom could. <laughs> Harboring and, resentment. But at, but at some point, I just got bored of, you know, palming coins all the time and making them disappear. Like, I need to really expand. And then I, I got into cards, and that changed my whole world. Uh, I started going to the magic store all the time. There was, uh, what was it called? Steve Dawson's 
uh, Magic Touch in Milpitas, uh, California. And uh, my mom would drop me off there like on a Sunday or something. And I would just sit around and look at everything. And then I would buy one trick or something, you know, or a book. And I was like, this is awesome. And I was just learning. And then I got uh, the David Roth uh, videos came out. And I remember sitting, like, trying to make my retention vanish look like that for millions of hours. <laughs> and it, I work with him now. You know, <laughs> like, uh, it still doesn't look that good. <laughs> <laughs> so I chalked that one up as a loss. <laughs> and uh, let's see. I started getting Magic Magazine uh, in the mail, and I wanted to meet David Roth really bad. And he was going to be at the convention at the Capitol. They used to have this great uh, A1 Multimedia. They changed their name to A1 Magical Media. Then they went out of business. (laughs) (laughs) You know, I think uh, they were hosting these amazing magic conventions uh, in Sacramento, And uh, I didn't know how amazing, you know, at the time. I wanted to go see David Roth. And I told my uh, mom and dad, like, I want to go to a convention. This one, David Roth is going to be there. And they, like, figured out that this is a great way for their kid to learn and meet other magicians. And I was like, cool, you know, I get to go. And they found that there was another one a couple months earlier, I think in uh, Reno and we always went to Reno around that time for Hot August Nights this old car show super fun and fascinating that's cool and uh, so I went there and went to the convention I met Jerry Andrews and uh, Sylvester the Jester oh wow both both of them fooled the crap out of me (laughs) Alan Ackerman was there I remember I got his uh, lecture notes you know because someone had bought them and I was like what is this secret, you know, super secret card stuff? You know, I didn't know. And uh, I got it, and there was like hand ping <laughs> chin with cards. And I was like, why would you want to do that? It's great for that coins through the table. You know, you don't need it with cards. And I didn't understand it. <laughs> but I did like, uh, I heard about Jerry Andrus only in whispers. You know, like someone was like, he has the card. It's on the face. He waves his hand over the deck, and the card changes, but it's not the second card. He shows you. It's, like, way down in the middle, and I was like, I don't even know why it would be the second card. <laughs> this is amazing. You know? <laughs> and uh, so, uh, I don't know. I was there and learning. I remember my mom bought me a tuxedo. You know, <laughs> off the rack at the dealer's thing. Like, I'm going to wear some tuxedo and <laughs> produce rabbits or something. And then uh, I remember I was reading the magazines all the time. The convention at the Capitol was coming up, and it's coming up, and I can't wait. And then all of a sudden, David Ross name not on the advertisement. And I was like, what? Why would they leave off David Roth? He's the only reason to go anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, so I called him. Uh, this is probably the first phone call I ever made. <laughs> I was like, hold on. <laughs> Suck it up, Ricky. Call someone. You know, and I called. And I was like, uh, excuse me, your advertisements for the convention at the Capitol had David Roth, and now he's not there. And they were like, we're sorry, he had to cancel. But I think you'll be very pleased to hear that uh, we got Juan Tamarys to fill in for him. And I was like, I don't know who that is. You know, and I <laughs> slammed the phone down. And I'm like, this is stupid. So right off the bat, I hated Juan Tamarys. I was like, I have to go see stupid Juan Tamarys filling in for David Roth. You know, who can fill his shoes? And so I went to this convention, like, Martin Nash was there, I think, and he fooled the crap out of me. I was like, what? This guy's this amazing cheater. And uh, Jerry Andrews, I just sat with him for the longest time, and he's teaching me some of his cool slides, like the panoramic shift and the sidewinder shift and that color change. He's like, keep your right hand limp. And I'm like, I can't do that <laughs> yet. <laughs> you know, I have no muscle control. <laughs> or something. And, but eventually I learned it. And uh, I remember Lee Asher and Aaron Fisher were downstairs at the bar 
doing like crazy things with cards like he was doing the diving board double and the silver surfer I think uh, Lee was and his twisting the aces and I was like what I must have these miracles and then uh, Lee was doing all this fancy stuff and I walked over to Aaron Fisher and he was just squaring the cards <laughs> the whole time and I was like boring you know not realizing that Aaron was probably doing the best shifts, you know, that I've ever seen, you know, but I, I didn't understand. I was just like, how come everyone's standing around the boring guy? And then, uh, you know, later on I got all their notes and stuff. I remember I was afraid to buy sex cells, you know, because <laughs> I was like, I don't think I'm old enough to buy it. And so I had, I, I had my dad go over to buy it. <laughs> and then, uh, of course, Lee came over and he's like, here you go. And then he had uh, these red stickers that he put on it. And he's like, but first, I got to pop your cherry. And like <laughs> slid his finger through the sex sales book and popped the sticker open. And I was like, wow, I'm getting so old. <laughs> 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 My second porn. <laughs> and uh, it was an awesome convention. Larry Jennings was there and Bill Goodwin was pushing him around. And uh, I didn't even realize... Uh, Paul Harris was there his three book set had just came out The Art of Astonishment and my dad was so nice he got it for me and I, uh, Paul signed it and no one was around I was just hanging out with Paul Harris and I was like this is great in fact he was the first person I saw when I walked in and it blew my mind I was like what he's just right there checking in I know that hey, feeling and uh, you're like this isn't how it worked in sports you know? <laughs> when I went to sporting things it was like nope you never get to meet him <laughs> you know, or something and here was one of the greats you know standing right in front of me and then the next day I was he signed my books and uh, he was like do you do any tricks and I was like yeah and I did you know my horrible magic for him you know and he was like oh that's fine <laughs> I'm like I don't believe you. <laughs> and then uh, I, he he just said, oh, look, you know, like Larry Jennings here. You should go say hi to Larry Jennings. And I was like, I don't know who Larry Jennings is. <laughs> but I went over there because Paul Harris told me to, you know, and I said, hello, you know, and like shook his hand awkwardly and then <laughs> left. But uh, later on, it was the biggest blessing. I was like, shit, I got to meet Larry Jennings. It's like the closest I got to meeting Di Vernon, yeah. you know, almost or something. And uh, so I was really happy about that later, especially once uh, the Thoughts on Cards videos, I got those. I remember going, wow, Larry Jennings is a badass. I can't believe that he does all those things. And uh, so it was a great convention. And then Juan Tamriz is about to perform. And I'm like, I don't know. for all the lectures, I was in the front row you know, ev on the on hours before, you know, just <laughs> sitting there because that's what you do as a child. You don't know that it's better to hang out. You're like, what's next? I can't wait to go to the lecture, you know, or something. <laughs> like, it's on the schedule. I have to be there. It's like class. <laughs> and then uh, I, I get there. But Juan Tamarins, I'm like, fuck it. And I stood way in the back. I'm like, I don't even want to see this, you know, like. First thing he does, he's this crazy old man, and he pulls some sausages out of a guy's coat. And I'm like, what is this, kid's magic or something? I want to see some cool sleight of hand, and this is not it. You know, or something. <laughs> and then the cards went across and I, into the guy's pocket. I'm like, what? <laughs> what the hell just happened? And he proceeded to do that for many hours. <laughs> and then he finished, and he had his books for sale. And... Uh, I didn't realize how lucky and how hard I was to get them at the time. And uh, I went and I got, you know, like the magic way and uh, five points in Sonata. Wow. You know, for cheap. Yeah. You know? And you're and, young. Really yeah. Young. And so I had all, like, my book collection was really nice starting out uh, really early. And uh, I don't know, it was pretty, it was so amazing. It was so fortuitous, even though I was upset. I was experiencing one of the coolest things you know that could happen to a young magician all on accident i don't know it was, and then i was just hooked you know i got the 
Larry Jennings VHS tapes at one point. You know, they had that cool photo of him sitting at the castle in black and white just staring at cards. Yeah. I was like, this guy's my guy, you know, like, just at the bar, castle, cards. I didn't even know how to drink until I was 21, <laughs> but I knew that I wanted to be there. You wanted to be that cool? Yeah. And uh, I remember there were so many hard tricks in there, and I learned all of them, like weird half passes and... Uh, mucking you know for ace assemblies <laughs> and uh that stuff uh that was fun for me i liked learning all the hard stuff and uh that helped me i remember uh i came home from that convention and all i wanted was more books i had gotten a copy of arthur buckley's uh principles and deceptions because david roth had mentioned it on his videos <laughs> <clears throat> and uh, I remember like sitting there because it, it was an old first edition copy like with the pebbled cover and I was like wow I own something so old you know I was so gentle with it not knowing that you know like the 50s or something aren't really that old <laughs> you know I thought I had some ancient relic <laughs> and uh, I thought this is great I need more books and I I got home and I took out my LNL catalog or I must have something like that and I I made a list I used to make lists of all the books that I wanted and I would like check them off yeah and uh, I remember <clears throat> like one of my biggest scores ever uh, Guy Hollingworth had just performed on World's Greatest Magic yeah he fooled the crap out of me I was like what what he's using like trick cards or something and I remember my friend in school, uh, who was also kind of into magic or something, Don Tran, uh, you know, he he didn't know that much about magic yet. He was just learning. But he was smarter than me because he sat and watched the video. Like, we all recorded it. We all had <laughs> stacks of VHS tapes with crappy recordings <laughs> of everything on TV that was magic. And uh, he said you know, like step by step and kind of figured out the reformation and the waving the aces. And he was like, yeah, you just kind of do this. And I was like, what? It's not fake as shit. <laughs> you know, like I couldn't believe it. And then I was like, I got to learn more about this guy Hollingworth. And then he was on the cover of uh, magic magazine. And, uh, like I remember it said he's going to school at Brunel university. And, the interweb had just been invented and uh, I typed in Brunel and Hollingworth and like this GWR Hollingworth at Brunel you know or something popped up and I was like I'll email him <laughs> and I emailed him like I'm sorry you know are you the guy Hollingworth and uh, what are some of your favorite books and he sent me back a list you know of 10 awesome books and uh, one of them was By Forces Unseen and uh, I, I think Classic Magic of Larry Jennings, maybe a few other ones. And I remember uh, calling LNL and ordering the books. And then they called me later. You know, this is before you did anything. You know, like I barely emailed someone. <laughs> and uh, so I'm getting calls back and forth. My mom would be like, uh, Salvador from LNL called. You know he wants you to call him back. You know, so, and I was like, oh okay. You know, and you, you call people back. You know, and uh, he was like, I'm very sorry. Uh, we're out of the classic magic of Larry Jennings, uh, but we do have deluxe edition copies available. I'll sell it to you for the same price. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> so I got like a signed copy of Classic Magic of Larry Jennings. You know, it had come out. Uh, before I kind of uh, knew too much about magic, so I, it hadn't been on my radar. Even though I had his videos, I didn't really realize that he had this book. And then uh, I was so excited to get it, and I got By Forces Unseen and Carnicopia all in one big package. And it was like the score of a lifetime. Yeah. Carnicopia, you know, that just told me, you know, what really good magic was and thinking, and then by forces I hadn't seen was this hardcore, you know, like crazy moves, you know, that st stayed with me forever. 
And then Larry Jennings was hardcore crazy ass moves in actual tricks. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I went to, I, I was going to magic meetings religiously. I went to IBM and uh, SA, IBM 216 and uh, SAM 94. The IBM used to meet at this old library. Excuse me. <laughs> and uh, I'm getting emotional too. <laughs> uh, I was the only kid. There was like two decent card guys, you know. There, one of them was this guy Daniel McCarthy, who had a book on uh, slide glances, and he was pretty good. I would always ask him questions, and he would help me. I'm like, I don't understand how you can do this pass, and no one sees it. You know, or something like that, and he would, yeah. he was the guy that always tells you some different move, you know, that's better, even though you, you're like, no, but I still want to learn the side steal, you know, but he's like, you know, you should do this deliberate side steal, I'm like, yeah, that's fine, you know, but <laughs> I want a card in a palm, even though I don't know what to do with it. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't understand, I spent the first three years palming coins, I got a palm card. And uh, so I was going to that all the time. And this is kind of backtracking a little. That's fine. But uh, I, I was going there, like the SAM 94 I used to meet in this old church. And uh, that's where I finally got to meet David Roth. He was doing a lecture. And I brought my best friend at the time, Scott Martin. I was like, dude, we got to go see this legendary coin man. My friend didn't know anything about <laughs> magic or care about magic. I just brought him because I thought this was the coolest thing that was happening in the whole world. You know, like, we have to go. <laughs> so I brought my friend. <laughs> and This I, is the event of the year. Uh, I remember, like, <clears throat> David Roth did the shell coins across into my friend's hand. And I turned to my friend, like, you fucker. You're in on it. <laughs> you know, because, like, how the hell does that last coin end up in there? <laughs> you know? It ends up in the person's hand. And I was like, dude, my friend is in on this shit. You know, or something like that. Because I didn't have a expanded shell so I never read that trick in the book you know I was like <laughs> I don't know how to do that I don't have that and uh so fooled fooled the pants off me but I'm going to magic meetings and I'm the only kid but my parents would drive me off and uh I'd hang out with old men all the time and they'd always make me perform <laughs> and uh, I remember one time I was doing one of Larry Jennings ace assemblies you know and uh, some some guy got mad at me. He's like, you need some patter. We don't know what's going on. You know, and I'm like, isn't it obvious, you know, that I'm doing Larry Jennings super crazy hard ace assembly? Why do I need to talk about it? You know? <laughs> I remember being so upset at the guy. <laughs> I was like, who cares? You made me come up here, you guys. <laughs> I'm just a child. But, uh, you know, probably it was the tough love that I needed. <laughs> and then uh, one day the twins came in <clears throat> you remember <laughs> and uh, I was like whoa other kids this is the best day of my whole life and like they went up and performed you know like they had some uh, ace routine or something that they were doing you know that they had learned at their uh, class or something like that you know it was okay and uh, I remember going wow other kids and they know how to perform and uh, go on stage you know, or something and so afterwards at the you know uh, we were just hanging out and I was like let me show you this and I showed them everything that I know like <laughs> these crazy things like I knew Sybil and some Lee Asher stuff like a bunch of really cool things and I was so proud of having collected them you know, and then uh, I had worked really hard to learn them. And then the next month, these darn kids came back, and they had learned, mastered all of it already. <laughs> and I was like, what? <laughs> How do you learn stuff so fast? And it was like, we practice all the time. And I'm like, practice? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know. <laughs> I just fiddled around, you know. It was something to do. But they, they knew about... Uh, uh, having a goal, you know, reaching that goal. I still haven't learned that. <laughs> and uh, I don't know, like, they they progressed. And then the only reason I'm any good is because I was trying to keep up. Uh, like, uh, 
I remember we went, I was like, you got to go to one of these conventions. They're the best things, these conventions. And so we went and we're hanging out with uh, Lee Asher and stuff. And Lee Asher is selling lecture notes from his backpack, you know, and like, I was like, you know, we got to get these notes. And I buy the notes and I take them home and I read them, you know, and I learn the stuff. That's what I got from that. And they got, all right, we got to make our own stuff. We got to put it in notes and we got to get backpacks. And then we got to put notes in the backpacks and then we sell the notes. And I was like, that's like 10 steps further than I went with this, you know? And so the next convention we go to, I show up and they're like, here's a copy of our notes. I'm like, what? How did you make notes? You know, like, we're not, we're just small children. We don't know how to do things like that. But they knew. And uh, I was like, wow, th these guys are so clever with their brilliant ideas. <laughs> and uh, so we... They had cr crappy copies of Artifice, Ruse, and Subterfuge in the hands. You know, the book with the most spelling errors of all time. <laughs> and uh, it was great. I was like, holy crap. You know, I think they signed it to me nice. <laughs> we were always nice to each other. We would, like, write these wonderful inscriptions. I'd, so I copied them. I wrote, like some crap notes. They have the same title as all my notes, <laughs> which are nothing as it seems. And I remember I, I like, I was like, my stuff's going to be super exclusive, you know, and I printed three copies. <laughs> you know, or something. And I, I think I printed one, you know, or something to Dan and Dave, you know, copy one of one, you know, like made it all fancy. But then, uh, so someone wanted one, like Nathan Cranzo or something, and uh, someone else. And so I, I think maybe Gary Plants, I don't know. But I, I, I sent out like three copies of my first notes. I was all proud. And then, uh, I don't know, we, we just went to conventions. Our parents were thought I was responsible. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> like I had some kind of... Uh, charade going on you know where I would get perfect grades and was brilliant and <laughs> never did anything wrong and uh, that turned out to be false <laughs> but uh, it was true at the time and uh, our parents would just send us off sometimes they would go you know if it was Vegas and they felt like going to Vegas they would go and then other times it would just be uh us, we'd have a hotel room. I didn't even know how we checked in. We didn't have credit cards, <laughs> money, food. We had like uh, playing cards. We'd have, you know, our Costco bicycle cards. And then I remember one of our first Las Vegas conventions, someone had like tally hose or something. And we're like, where did you get those? <laughs> you know, and he's like, the Gambler's General Store. And we're like, we have to go. And we got screwed on the taxi ride. Like, three kids hop into your taxi in Vegas, and you're like, I'm going around the world. <laughs> or something. And I think it was like $45, and we're like, we've never spent so much money in our whole lives. You know, we probably had 120 between us, you know, for the week-long convention. <laughs> and uh, we weren't planning on eating. And, <laughs> and uh we walked into the Gambler's General store, and I remember going, like, eyes all big. Like, what are all these cards? I couldn't believe it, you know? And I picked out, like, a dozen blue tally. Like, you got to pick which color you wanted. <laughs> Instead of that stupid Costco thing where you get half red and half blue, this was a whole brick of blue tally hose circle packs, like the professor... And I remember just sitting there going, like, this is the greatest day of my whole life. I can't believe it. I can't believe that I have these. And, uh, you know, we all, like, we had these little, those little shopping carts, you know, whatever, the handheld ones. Yeah, yeah. And we were just filling it with cards going, like, I can't believe we get to buy these, <laughs> you know. And uh, we, we were asking if they had any Jerry's left. You know, of course, yeah, yeah. we were, like, 20 years too late. <laughs> Bill Kalush had already been there. <laughs> and uh, I, I was just so excited to have Tally Ho cards. And so every time that we went to Vegas, we would go there. 
But we're sitting there and we're acting like kids. We would always end up throwing cards at each other at some point in the room. And the whole room would be covered with cards all over the place. And then we'd come back to the room later, and the poor maid had, like, picked them all up and stacked them. You know, they're all mixed. It's, like, ten different decks, and they're all ruined, but they would be in a nice pile on the dresser, and we're like, all right, throw them again. (laughs) (laughs) Reload. (laughs) We'd have, like, little cuts on each other, because we were were pretty good. And uh, we'd, we'd always try to go hang out with the cool people be like Bill Goodwin's here we have to meet him but he's at the bar (laughs) and uh, we're not allowed in the bar and uh, we're not allowed in the casino I remember uh, Brian Tudor you know or something he was like you guys want to go hang out with those guys that's what you're doing right and we're like yeah we want to go hang out with those guys but they're in we keep getting kicked out and he told us uh, they can't kick like Brian's dad was like a lawyer or something or a psychologist or something. Brian always knew like weird ass loopholes to things <laughs> that weren't true. <laughs> he got Dan and Dave kicked out of Disneyland. <laughs> you know, like I remember we we drove down there in the twins' new rice rocket, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> like uh, I think Dave backed into a parking pole because we <laughs> we didn't even know how to drive probably. <laughs> I made them listen to Pearl Jam 10 400 times in a row. <laughs> now they hate it. <laughs> and uh, we get down there, and the person that we know is Brian Tudor. And uh, he's like, let's go to dinner. And we're like, wow, we're going to dinner. And uh, we get there, and he's like, a oh, party of four, you know, or something. And they're like, oh, it'll be an hour wait. And uh, we're like, okay, you know, that's what humans do. They wait. But Brian Tudor doesn't do anything like a human. And he's like, there's a table over there. Let's sit down. And so we go. We just sit at this table like we got sat there. And then the lady comes by and she's like, I'm sorry, you can't sit here. And Brian yells at her and we get kicked out of the restaurant. (laughs) And uh, I don't know, just so many stupid things. Well, what was the loophole at the casino? Uh, Okay. And uh, so he told us, as long as... He knew some law or something. Maybe it's not even true. But he was like, well, actually, you can walk through the casino as long as you're going somewhere else. So all you have to do is walk really, really slow. Baby steps. Baby steps, you know, through the thing. And so we're taking these small steps, you know, like walking by the the cool guys. Like, what's going on? What is that? He did something, you know, or something. And then we'd have to turn around and go back (laughs) really slow. I don't know. And it was just always trying to hang out with the cool kids. I remember uh, Lee Asher and Joey Burton and uh, Aaron Fisher and all those guys, you know, they would just leave the convention and disappear for a long time. And I was like, man, they're doing the real work. We're missing out on the real work damn you know like they they always leave you know like we hang out with them for a little while and then they leave and then that's when they talk about the really cool stuff we know is true you know and then like because the twins were awesome eventually we got invited up there and we found out it's the same thing as downstairs (laughs) they're not doing anything here that's so exciting Uh, well, they were doing exciting things. You know? <laughs> you have to be older to know about that kind of stuff. <laughs> and uh, I don't know. It was awesome. I, I had a great childhood. Yeah. It's so, <laughs> so amazing. It, God, it's, uh, it's yeah, I, I can empathize with you in many ways. <laughs> I remember going to MagicCon. Uh, the second MagicCon was my first Magic Convention. And you kind of picked a good one. <laughs> <laughs> and I yeah I remember walking in and being like that's David Blaine right there <laughs> yeah it's so weird <laughs> yeah that's Ricky Smith that's you know yeah it's weird how do you feel now that you're a grown man mostly and <laughs> and you are friends and colleagues with your your heroes and your idols. Uh, it's pretty crazy. Uh, I never thought I would, you know, go so far w- with magic or with meeting my idols. 
Like, uh, I got really into Di Vernon and John Carney. So, you know, anything surrounding the professor, you know, like you hear about Charlie Miller. I tried to learn as much as I could about Charlie Miller. But then you hear about uh, Ricky Jay and Percy Diaconis and Steve Freeman. And it was like, those are the the real secret keepers. Yeah. Like, they don't talk to anyone. And I was... I was like, man, you know, like, that would be the coolest, you know, they're the coolest people to meet because they're impossible to meet. And uh, I got to go see Ricky Jay's 52 assistants a few times, which was incredible in my dream, you know. Uh, I felt so happy to have seen it, especially, I think I saw it three times, and I can't believe that happened. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I've gotten to meet Ricky Jay a few times, and... Uh, have dinner with him and it's like wow you know what else is there to do in life (laughs) (laughs) and uh, we got to meet Percy Diaconis a few times I even got to give him a tour of the Conjuring Arts which was pretty cool because Bill was absent that day it was the most fortuitous thing that's ever happened (laughs) no (laughs) it would have been better if uh, Bill was there he would have gotten a good tour instead (laughs) (laughs) But uh, I was happy about it. And, you know, so it feels like I've gotten to meet most of everyone that's good and spend time with Juan Tamriz. And I guess uh, I'm, I couldn't be happier, you know, yeah. about how I went. You know, I have a great group of friends everywhere that I go, and they're always really nice. I've met all my best friends through Magic, I think, except for a few college friends and uh it's going good (laughs) i have more cards than i can ever use (laughs) and uh i spent all my money until i turned 30 on magic books (laughs) and dan and dave have them (laughs) i think it's a pretty decent collection and so i'm pretty proud of that i got the magic magic book recently which was very elusive for me just because when you even do see them for sale it's like wow that's more money than i've ever had (laughs) (laughs) what is this the magic magic book yeah it's a ricky j did a an exhibit at the whitney i think is that right yeah and uh it was on blow books which are we all know it as the stupid uh magic coloring book but it's one of the coolest tricks you can do. Like, if you watch Bill Kalush perform it with one of his old ones, and, you know, you the old guys, they used to blow on the book, and it would change, you know, to all colors. And then they'd say, like, and my secrets are in here. You have to do this. And then you can read the secrets of my magic. And words would appear, and then they'd disappear. It must have been some of the most astonishing things that you know, people had seen, you know, when well done. I know it's a stupid coloring book trick. It's been trivialized, yeah. But uh, it's still a really cool principle. And so Ricky J did an exhibit on uh, different blow books and stuff like that. And he had a a book set that you could buy with it. And one of them's like a delightful history of the blow book and, you know, different books that explained it and uh, told you how to make it. Then the second one is a blow book with a different uh, artists doing each uh, segment. And there are like 300 copies made, only 170 were for sale. And so they're just not around. A bunch of art collectors probably have them sitting in their libraries, you know, and don't even care about magic. And uh, so they don't show up so often and so, I don't know, there's one that's always on Bookfinder, you know, or ABE books, you know, and it, it says like $3,000. And every once in a while, I would be like, I did something, you know, and I would have $1,000. I'd be like, I could put the rest on my Amex you know, and <laughs> pay it off for the rest of my life. <laughs> and I, I, would, I would think about things like that. And then uh, I, I never... Uh, got the gumption and then uh, my wife worked at a deal where she got it for me for Christmas and for our first anniversary because the first anniversary is paper I got her like a 
piece of binder paper, you know, <laughs> that was a uh, cloth. <laughs> but it, it looked like binder paper and you embroider, you know, a note into it. So it, it was my humor, you know. <laughs> and uh, so she she won that one. And we'll see about next year. <laughs> I hope that the second anniversary is the magic anniversary. <laughs> That's the only one I could win, maybe. I don't know where I was going with that. All right. <laughs> I was just talking about meeting and knowing and being friends with. Oh, and... uh, yeah. I'm super spoiled. Like, Bill Kalush is one of the great card men of all time and historians. And, uh, you know, Di Verner writes about, you know, a 17-year-old Bill Kalush in his column because Bill Kalush did the most amazing pass he'd ever seen. Like, Di Verner wrote about it in his column... And meanwhile, the professor was like 80 or 90 years old. He had seen Dr. Elliot, Nate Leipzig, Charlie Miller, you know, everyone. And he wanted to talk about Bill Kalush, about the pests, you know. Uh, Bill has that great routine, the inversion routine, and uh, a few, like, scattered things. So you don't get to learn too much about them. You just know that they're... It's this amazing enigma, you know, that exists somewhere. An elusive creature. Yeah. Hidden away in the back cave. I remember, like, meeting him was crazy talk. <laughs> and uh, so I'm very spoiled to have gotten to spend time with him. And uh, we probably drank more whiskey together than anybody, most people have drank whiskey in their whole lives <laughs> you know, or something <laughs> we used to get Lefroy by the case <laughs> and it was always the saddest day when bottle 40 ran out <laughs> you know or something like that <laughs> gotta order more <laughs> uh, so I, that's that's been probably one of the you know knowing the twins and knowing Bill has gotten me to meet more people than uh, anything else you know cause Twins are so talented. Everyone wants to see them and meet or be around them. And then uh, Bill, you know, like, he's the same way. All the old guys want to see Bill and hang around with him. So because of that, I get to meet almost everyone. So I'm pretty spoiled, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> are you still, like, intimidated when you get to hang out with somebody that you really admire? Yeah. Does it still give you kind of flutters? Yeah. It does me uh, too. <laughs> You know, I've spent time with Ricky J, you know, a few times. And, uh, like, I remember he called the library one time. And I was like, you know, thank you for calling Conjuring Arts. This is Ricky. How may I help you? You know, because that's how I learned how to answer the phone at a business when I worked at Togo's Sandwiches <laughs> when I was 14. <laughs> so I've, I learned that much. <laughs> and, uh. He's like, this is Ricky J. Is uh, Bill Kalush there? And I'm like, yes, can you hold, please? And he's like, well, let's uh, talk for a minute or something, you know? And I, I was like, uh, yeah, everything's fine. All right, you know, because I'm scared <laughs> to death. You know, I'm like, this is one of my great heroes, you know, and did one of the most beautiful uh, card acts of all time with crazy sleight of hand in it, you know? I just, I can't get over it. Uh, he was doing a lecture at the uh, talk. I guess it was an interview at uh, New York Public Library. And uh, afterwards, uh, he was hanging out. And I just walked over with David Roth, you know, to say, you know, nice work or something. I thought, if I get to say that, you know, that's that's a win. <laughs> you know, like, if he even notices me, that would be really cool. And uh, he said, you know, like... Uh, oh, good to see you or something, and shook my hand, and I was like, all right, see you later, you know, and I left, and my wife was like, what the hell was that? I'm like, it was the greatest thing that's ever happened, and she's like, no, he, like, shook your hand and wanted to talk with you, it seems like, and you just left, <laughs> and I was like, you don't know how it works, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I don't know, so I'm, I'm still terrified. I, I think I would be... Uh, intimidated by Steve Freeman. You know, I haven't uh, spent very much time with him. That would be cool. Uh, 
I don't know. My list of people that I haven't met is very short. The one that I'm the most sad about is Paul Chassi. I wanted to meet him so bad because of that story about him uh, doing the diagonal palm shift. Yeah. I think he was doing it for Bill Kalush, you know, and uh, someone else. They were like dumbfounded because they all knew the diagonal palm shift and it wasn't like they saw it and were like, oh, that was really good. They had no idea that it had happened. Yeah. You know, like no idea. And I was like, that's the best way to do sleight of hand of all time. You know, like. I want to meet this person. I want to do sleight of hand like that. I always thought that, you know, the twins were doing their flourishes and I was working on, you know, like my half pass or something. And I thought, you know, no one ever wants to talk to me, you know, or whatever. And uh, uh, it's because I was sitting there just squaring the cards (laughs) for hours. Like, uh, and at at some point I thought, well, that's pretty good. If no one wants to talk to you, that means your sleight of hands go work it's working well. <laughs> <laughs> but granted, I had the best misdirection of all time, <laughs> but <laughs> the twins. But <laughs> you know, uh, so I thought that was pretty cool. Oh, darn! <laughs> oh well, <laughs> where was I going? <laughs> Paul Chassie. Oh yeah, Paul, Paul Chassie. Chassie. And uh, so I wanted to meet him so bad, you know, and uh, he had started posting on the Magic Cafe and uh, I met Dorian Rodell, who called him Uncle Paul because they knew each other really well. And uh, I wanted to meet him, but he was over in Boston and uh, I I couldn't figure out a way to do it. And uh, Dorian invited me to go to this convention You know, it was probably a Hank Lee's or something horrible, you know. But uh, he was going there to hang out with Paul at the same time. And so I paid for the convention and booked my flight. And this is, I was in college and I had gotten my first internship down at Technicolor in Camarillo. And I was commuting from the Twins house in downtown because... Who the hell wants to live in Camarillo when your friends are 40 minutes away? <laughs> you know, you, you commute <laughs> every day. <laughs> and uh, so I had gotten this job, and the convention was like two weeks after the start date. But I, so I walked in on my first day, you know, and did the ropes, and then the second day seemed like okay to tell them I was going to be gone for a week. You know, I'm a stupid intern, you know, they don't need me. And, uh, so I told him, you know, I got this thing as planned before, and he was like, you can't go. That's right when my boss's boss is coming back, and he wants to meet you, you know, like, that's really, it's really going to look bad. And I was like, oh, what the hell, you know? This is probably why I've never worked in my whole life <laughs> is this situation. <laughs> I was like, what? I don't get to go? You know, like... And I was like, okay, You're I, my happiness. I guess I don't get to go. And then, uh, so I didn't go, you know, and uh, that was my chance to meet him. He passed away not too long afterwards, and I blew it. And I was like, oh, man, you know. And that story about uh, Di Vernon breaking both of his arms, you know, during his only job. And then John Scarney walking in and saying, just goes to show like guys like you and me shouldn't work you know or something. <laughs> uh, and uh, I, I was I was like that's what it's like you shouldn't work <laughs> and so I've never had a reputable job ever since <laughs> and I was moving boxes the other day and I crushed my finger and I wanted to take a photo of it for Instagram and go like Shows why guys like you and me shouldn't work. <laughs> but I, I didn't do it because it's too gross. No one, wa- no one wants to see it. <laughs> it's fine. You could do it. I'd like it. <laughs> so that's my life story. I'm married now. 400 kids that I don't know about. And uh, hopefully one soon that I do know about. <laughs> you have names picked out? Uh, firepower and moonshine. <laughs> <laughs> right on. <laughs> I, I saw 
Someone was reading a, one of those horrible magazines next to me on the plane. <coughs> My wife. <laughs> and uh, someone had had a baby and they named it Spurgeon. <laughs> I was like, what the hell kind of name is this? Spurgeon. You know? <laughs> well, a sturgeon and a sperm whale met in the ocean. And things happened. <laughs> and that's how you were born. <laughs> Spurgeon. <laughs> oh, uh. <laughs> That's the worst name I've ever heard. Yeah. <laughs> are you curious about the time? Do you want to say how long are we going? I don't know. How long are you supposed to go? We got at least like another hour and a half. Uh, <laughs> look at the time. I have to go rearrange my sock drawer. <laughs> I'll be back. <laughs> We've been going about an hour. Uh. I didn't get an e- a word in edgewise, though, I'm which is sorry. exactly what I wanted. Let's do uh, Elliot's turn. <laughs> no, no, no. Um, What's your favorite thing about Ricky Smith? <laughs> his beard. <laughs> um, the, if you could give a wet willy to one of the Buck Twins, which one would you pick? <laughs> Justin. <laughs> that sounds dangerous. It does. I remember the last thing I ever did. one of the first times I uh, met Justin, uh, I came down. The twins were living in uh, LA area in the Orange County. I think they were still going to film school, you know, before they realized that it's not necessary when you're a genius to go to school. And, uh, I had been there before and it was great, you know, like hang out, we go to the castle or something if we could get in. And uh, uh, Justin was there this time. And it was like one of my first times I've ever met him, you know, and uh, he's kind of a gruff uh, character <laughs> or something. Uh, and uh, I walk in, you know, I'm this timid, you know, child. <laughs> I still am. <laughs> and. Uh, I remember he was like upset. He was like, dude, if you snore, I'm going to punch you in the face in your sleep. And I was like, what? (laughs) Who would do such a thing? You're a monster. (laughs) And then I'm like trying to go to sleep. I'm like, how do you prepare not to snore? Like, what do you do? You know, I'm like trying to figure it out because I'm like, something's going to happen and I'm going to snore and I'm going to get punched in the face. That doesn't sound so exciting, especially if you're fast asleep. <laughs> so I'm glad you would give him the wet willy. <laughs> Gift wrap that shit. <laughs> Bring it right over. <laughs> well, so how did it end up? Did you sleep through the night? Yeah, yeah. Justin's great. <laughs> you know, like, once you understand him, he's hilarious yep. <laughs> and a nice guy. Yeah. But uh, I remember that first time I was like, well, okay, <laughs> this is going horrible. <laughs> <laughs> I remember the first time I ever was not introduced to Jess, but the first time I was like, I think it looks like Dan and Dave. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was a, one of the magic cons that David Williamson pulled him up on stage <laughs> to do a trick. And he just sat in the chair as if he was about to melt out of it. You know, he was like so far <laughs> leaned back in the yeah. chair. Like totally standoff. <laughs> like, oh man, I was like, that guy doesn't seem to be having very much fun. <laughs> and then like, I asked him about it. We talked about it and he was like, oh yeah, something, I, I don't know, I was mad about something. And he was like, but then... Like, the next one, I was all into it, and I was obsessed with playing cards, and I was, like, trading with people, and, you know. (laughs) That was my first experience with Justin, was watching him not be entertained by David Williamson, which is a feat in itself. (laughs) Yeah. He's got some special qualities. So, man, okay, so, you guys met 20... Five years ago? How long have you guys known each other? Oh, yeah, shit. It's like 20 years. Yeah, more, probably 21 years. Our relationship can start drinking now. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's crazy. We've known each other longer than uh, we didn't know each other. <laughs> wow, that's awesome. That's really cool. And, like, <clears throat> what is it... How do you feel about, like, small children coming up to you and being like, oh, my God, 
God, that's Ricky Smith. And then like awkwardly introducing themselves to you. <laughs> it and it doesn't out. happen so often. So I'm always excited. You know, most of the time it's like, are you Ricky Smith? And I go, yep. And then they go, all right, see you later. <laughs> you know, or something. Or sign this playing card. What's your favorite one? And I go, six of clubs. And then they go through their deck and it's not there because Dan or Dave signed it. <laughs> and I'm like, God damn it. <laughs> Four diamonds. <laughs> That's funny. This is uh, not common knowledge, but on all of the decks that we made at Conjuring Arts, uh, my face is on the Four of Diamonds. <laughs> That's not true. <laughs> 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 Bill Kalush is the king of hearts. I'm the four of diamonds. <laughs> <laughs> Playing the king of spades. That's pretty funny. Yeah. Um, I don't remember the first time I met you, but I think it was when you did your... No, it was... I guess it was the second Magic Con. But it was, yeah, it was one of those things, like, are you Ricky Smith? Yeah, okay. <laughs> and then... Welcome to my presence. Yeah. What's your third favorite color? <laughs> yes. And, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And there was some cherry controlling involved. Uh, oh, my God. That was so funny. Yeah, that was... Yeah, that was the first time I met you. Is thanks. At Magic Con, I was uh, sitting with some people that I was with, and you were, like, in the row in front of us, and you were showing us your tricks with the cherry control <laughs> and it was probably one of the hardest times I've ever laughed <laughs> it was so funny I've never seen such like hilarious non sequitur magic <laughs> <laughs> all my magic is just fodder for <laughs> uh, or all my routines are just fodder for slides it's like <laughs> I, I, this slide needs a presentation. <laughs> <laughs> What's your third favorite? <laughs> so yeah, how how often do you perform? Because uh, I know you you, you do I do it at, you know all the time informally. Uh, we have this program called the Hocus Pocus Project, yep. where we go to different hospitals and children's centers and prisons, and. Uh, <clears throat> teach kids magic you know and uh so you have to win them over so i do a few tricks you know that's kind of like my performing at the moment and then i do almost all of my performing happens at 31 faces north i think <laughs> they they they're crazy people <laughs> they think i'm worth watching <laughs> what is what is 31 faces north uh, it's this convention in Toronto that uh, Alan Slate and uh, Magicana and David Ben put on. Really, Julie Ang does everything because she's awesome. Yeah. She's a wonder woman. You know? yeah, yeah. And uh, they uh, invited me one year uh, and I got to go. But uh, of course, they always have the attendees do stuff. So they wanted a... a like 20 minute show or something. <laughs> I think I got eight minutes. <laughs> you know? And uh, so that's how I had to come up with, uh, like I started doing shows a little bit, you know, was for that. And they would have me do one every year for a few years. And so I ended up with three or four shows, you know, all original material and stupid jokes. And uh, I don't know, that's helped me be really creative. And that's, my only kind of formal performing, I think. Yeah, I don't yeah. know. I don't do so much. I like better the at the bar doing some tricks for sure. friends. I get really nervous and uh, I shuffle around <laughs> <laughs> and uh, give people hugs. <laughs> if you get scared, uh, David Blaine gave me some advice where uh, you act way more nervous, like super nervous and then you feel stupid for acting nervous you know because you're doing it way over the top and then you're not nervous anymore and uh that helps a little bit and then also you go up on the stage and walk around a little bit before anyone gets there like i have a i always try to get there as early as i can and walk around on the stage being in a room before everyone else and knowing it inside and out when the first person walks in, 
they walk in and they go, there's someone here and it's your room. Yeah. And that, that helps me feel a lot better. You get comfortable with the space. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it feels like it's your place and everyone else is just visiting, you know, or something like that. And that, that's helpful. Yeah. That's a great tip. Um, what are, what are some other, the one from Blaine and then this one as well. Um, what are some other tips you've learned along the way with your studies and your, like what, like what are the things that stand out to you the most that you would I don't know. give? How to practice is really important. You know, uh, just sitting there doing the move over and over is part of it, but it's not the whole thing. You got to sit and think about it. Uh, one thing that is my favorite thing is learning as much as I can about something, and uh, that helps you find other things as well. So I think the footnotes in books was, you know, just learning that they were there <laughs> and uh, following them up was super helpful. You know, you, you're having trouble with some hard move, you know, or something, and you see that, you know, the one-handed bottom palm by Ernest Zierick was also uh, conceived by Paul Curry and uh, Dr. Daly. And uh, so you kind of, you know, like, you go back and you look up the things that came before, and that helps you understand where the guy was coming from, who invented it. And that uh, makes it a lot easier to learn things. And while you're looking up all those other old books, you're also learning, you, you run into other things that inspire you and just snowballs. So, I don't know, studying's really important. That helped me through my whole life, learning that in magic, you know, it made school so easy. Like, kids don't realize how easy school is. <laughs> uh, and you know that it's horrible, you know, to do your homework or something like that. But if you actually uh, do a little bit of work, a lot of that stuff becomes really easy. You'll, you'll be surprised, <laughs> I think. I don't know. Yeah, and the, the more intentionality you have about it, the easier it becomes. Because it snowballs, like you said. Uh, my wife's calling me. Oh, okay. <laughs> I you guess I'm, I'm done. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much for doing it, Ricky. We're going to have to cut it off, but we'll do it again. Okay. Next time I see you, hopefully. Thanks, Elliot. Not Sunday, not tomorrow, but maybe yeah. down the road. Yeah, once I have a new life to talk about. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, okay. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>